Okay, members, it's uh, time for questions through the Executive Office, and I call her Leah Flynn to ask the first question. Uh, Gormie, I've got question number one. Mr Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions 1, 7 and 11 together. The Executive's response to and recovery from COVID-19 continues to be focused on the health and well-being of our citizens, our economic well-being and the revitalising of the economy and our societal and community well-being. The Executive is also placing a particular emphasis on people and families, as we know how important this is to everyone. This means that any decisions on the Executive's next steps will be informed by the impact they will have on us as individuals, families and the wider communities within which we all live. In addition to the financial support mechanisms provided by the United Kingdom Government, the Executive has put in place a range of targeted local schemes aimed at supporting individuals, families, communities and businesses at this difficult time. Going forward, we are committed to ensuring that support packages meet the need of those who are in need of help. Looking into 2021, the Executive has approved a recovery framework which is aimed at progressing a cohesive approach across the whole of government that will deliver an economic, health and societal recovery which has the citizen at its centre. This work will also complement the longer-term programme for government which is currently being developed and which we are aiming to have in place by April 2021. As uh, our recent statement will advise, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on all of the member administrations was central to the discussion at the British Irish Council Summit on 6 November. BIC members shared information on the measures which they have taken both to contain the virus and to mitigate its impact on health and on their economies. We also recognise the important continuing communication as we all work towards economic recovery while living with and managing the continuing threat posed by the virus. I call Orlea Flynn supplementary. Gormie Ogget, um, thank the Minister for her answer. Can the First Minister um, give a commitment that the promotion of positive mental health and the provision of support services for individuals and families um, who are struggling at the moment, that that will be central to any COVID-19 recovery package? I very much want to thank the member for her question. She will have heard the Chief Medical Officer uh, just this morning talk about the fact that mental health was a continuing pressure for us in the Executive. Uh, we are very concerned at the impact that this is having uh, immediately uh, and also in the medium to long term. So we will very much have to put in resources as well as a determination from the Executive to deal with this very real issue. Over the weekend, I was contacted uh, by a family friend of someone who, at 41 years of age, felt that she had lost all purpose in her life because she'd lost her job, and she'd attempted to take her own life on three occasions. I think that's a very sobering thing to hear, uh, Mr Speaker, and it's something that we all in this House should be very concerned about. So the answer is absolutely. We will be putting in place mechanisms to deal with uh, what I, I think I said last week I was afraid that we were going to face a mental health tsunami. That is a fear that I hold. I know it's something that's uh, shared right across the executive and it's something that we will have to deal with. And I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, could I maybe follow up? COVID didn't create the mental health crisis that we've got. It's adding to it. So could I ask, is there a long-term strategy or acceptance that we really need to deal with our mental health um, problems in Northern Ireland, not just now, but in the longer term? Well, I thank the member for that uh, question and observation because it's something that we identified upon coming back into the executive as one of our priorities to deal with. It's why we set up the subcommittee of the executive, which all ministers attend uh, and can attend, uh, to deal with resilience, well-being and mental health uh, provision. We recognised that before COVID-19 hit and we know now that that has exacerbated uh, the difficulties that we have. And when we meet uh, with groups from across Northern Ireland, albeit virtually at present, we are always reminded of this simmering undercurrent of mental health issues that exist right across Northern Ireland. So absolutely, it's something we recognise was there before COVID, but COVID has exacerbated the mental health crisis and we very much need to deal with it. They call Jonathan Buckley. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know the First Minister will be acutely aware of the devastating impact COVID-19 has had on our care homes across Northern Ireland. On the 12th of October, there were 46 care homes with COVID-19 outbreaks, yet on the 12th of November, that number had risen extraordinarily to 143, all at a time when hospitality and close contact services were closed. While we know that testing is one of the best answers to combat the spread, could the First Minister outline what conversations she had with uh, other counterparts across the British Irish Council about ways in which we can ramp up our test and trace capabilities? I thank the member for that question. Indeed, it is a cause of uh, deep concern to us that the numbers uh, of outbreaks in our care homes continue to rise, despite the very sterling work of our care home staff, and I, I want to make that uh, very clear. Um, but there is a need for us to have a more robust testing system. Um, the member may be aware that in Liverpool at present there is a pilot ongoing uh, where there is mass testing uh, taking place, and we have had some very good feedback from that uh, testing regime. And it certainly encourages me that we can do something similar right across Northern Ireland. We have a population of 1.8 million. I think it's something that shouldn't be beyond us. And uh, certainly from the Executive Office, we believe that test, trace and isolate and the capacity to do that in a meaningful way will very much be part of us trying to deal with the transmission of the virus. Nicole Colin McGrath. Mr. Speaker, um, Mr. Speaker, Nicola Mallon on the 3rd of November got the powers to be able to deliver a scheme for the taxi sector, and that scheme opened 30, on the 13th of November, 10 days later. Can the First Minister, as the lead of the executive, explain why, after four and a half weeks, many in the business sector are still waiting on a scheme being opened that they can apply to get much needed finance to give them some form of an income? Well, can I say to the member, whilst I, I do welcome the fact that the taxi uh, scheme is now open, it took a considerable amount of time to get there. Uh, I say to the members who have been waiting on this funding that uh, we are disappointed that it took such an amount of time to get there, but we are pleased that it has got there now. Uh, in terms of the schemes that were put in place to deal with the four-week uh, what was to be the four-week uh, intervention. That had to be uh, dealt with from scratch. Uh, as I understand it, from uh, the time when the economy minister was asked to put it in place, nine days later, the scheme was up and ready uh, and working, albeit just one day less than the member is speaking about. Uh, and the money is now uh, going out in, in different tranches. In terms of the LPS scheme, which deals with most of the money that goes out uh, into the community, I understand that it is moving now as well. Uh, but of course, we would always like to just switch on the button uh, and put the money out immediately. But I'm sure members of this House would be asking us questions about due process and public accountability for money if we didn't do things properly. And of course, they're very much entitled to do so, Mr. Speaker. We will do what we can as quickly as we can, but we also have to acknowledge that this is public money that we're dealing with. Nicole Kelly Armstrong. Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much, First Minister. First Minister, I'm delighted to hear that the BIC has been talking together, but I was wondering if there's any coordinated approach to the Christmas holidays and the levels of their restrictions. There may be, when we think about young people's mental health and families' mental health, getting our young people back from universities from across the UK would be vital at Christmas time. Very much thank the member for her question. This was something that we did discuss with other devolved administrations and Michael Gove last Wednesday because we recognise it is a huge issue, not just for young people but for families right across uh, the United Kingdom and indeed uh, from the Republic of Ireland as well. We will want to make sure that people can come together uh, at Christmas time. So that is a, a, an ongoing discussion. Um, I think it would be wise if we had the same restrictions and messaging and communications around that issue uh, so that there is no uh, room for uh, misunderstanding about how people can travel home for Christmas. And I know, for example, already some students who finish their course at the beginning of December will be tested and then they will be allowed to go home and maybe have to self-isolate for a period of time. But those conversations are continuing, uh, and I think very much we want to see a coordinated approach right across the United Kingdom. Call Jim Allister. Uh, First Minister, today the Health Minister publicly said that he could unilaterally bring in restrictions. Do you agree that he could, and what would be the consequences? Well, I think it depends on uh, whether you read the 1967 Act on its own or whether you read it 
in the, uh, uh, alongside the Northern Ireland Act, which very clearly says that controversial cross-cutting and uh, financially significant issues will have to come to the executive. So whilst he could technically make that decision, I think he will be open to judicial review. Let us just say that. Okay, before we move on to the next question, I'd just like to advise members that it took a, na- a number of additional supplementaries there on the basis that we had three questions grouped, so that wouldn't be the norm. Uh, Paula Bradshaw. Please. Our officials continue with preparatory work to legislate for the core elements of the rights, language and identity proposals contained in New Decade, New Approach. This includes arrangements to progress the Northern Ireland Act 1998 Amendment No. 1 Bill, which provides for the establishment of the Office of Identity and Cultural Expression. We will progress the legislation during 2020-2021 and establish the Office of Identity and Cultural Expression as quickly as possible thereafter. And of course, we will keep the Assembly updated on progress. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, um, First Minister, for your answer. Are you confident that the associated le- um, legislation will be on the statute book by the end of the Assembly term? Thank you. Uh, yes, I am confident. It's part of the New Decade New Approach um, uh, Agreement. Therefore, it's important that the basis on which we came back uh, is followed through upon, uh, not just in respect of this issue, but on a range of issues uh, where uh, our own government, the Irish government, and a range of other people have made commitments. So it's important that we follow through on those commitments. Need to, need to keep up. Doug Beatty. Uh, thanks, Mr Speaker. Um, Minister, you will know that I spent three torturous years on the Flags Identity, Culture and Traditions Commission um, uh, and produced a report which is now with the Executive Office. Uh, can I ask, is that report likely to be made public or is it acting purely as a reference document for the, the new Identity um, Office? So thank you uh, to the member for his question, and can I say I feel your pain uh, in relation to that issue. Um, The report was submitted to us on the 17th of July. It was my 50th birthday present, and I really want to say thank you for it. Uh, And in concluding its work, the Commission was very much aware uh, of the content of New Decade, New Approach, which I've just referred to. Um, Junior ministers have met with the joint chairs of the Commission um, that took place on the 20th of October uh, to discuss the report uh, and its recommendations. And we're currently considering the content of the report and the appropriate next steps, uh, including a decision on uh, the full publication of the report. It, uh, can, you. Uh, can, I, can the Minister outline her understanding of the relationship between the Office of Identity and Cultural Expression and the Offices of the Irish Language Commissioner and the Commissioner to enhance the Ulster Scots and Ulster British identity? Thank you. So the bills uh, uh, provide for three separate appointments, the Director into the Office and then two Commissioners uh, to lead the, uh, the three bodies and uh, the Office and the Commissioners therefore are independent uh, of each other. Um, But the office may provide support services both to the Irish Language Commissioner and indeed to uh, the Ulster British Commissioner. Uh, And I think that it's important to recognise that they should all work together because if we're serious uh, about representing the plurality of uh, cultures and identity here in Northern Ireland, uh, then there shouldn't be any difficulty with three bodies working together. Thanks very much indeed, First Minister, for outlining that and your commitment to have the legislation in in place within this Assembly term. Will that legislation, as of itself, define the roles of the Commissioners and their function, the office that that they have, their functions? Yeah, well, in terms of the the Commissioners, um, they will be defined in the the various pieces of legislation to amend the Northern Ireland Act. As you know, that's the way we're taking this forward, that the Northern Ireland Act will be amended. Uh, so that these bodies uh, and commissioners can be set up, so that it will be clear in the legislation what the rules are uh, of the two commissioners and indeed of the Office of Identity and Cultural Expression. Moving on, I call Sinead Bradley. Question three. Uh, This is a key time for victims and survivors, with preparations for the Victims Payment Scheme progressing 
concerns around legacy issues and looking ahead towards the next victim strategy. It is important that we consider all matters fully and move forward in the right way, and we have decided to appoint a new Commissioner for Victims and Survivors. We have instructed our officials to begin the work required to commence the appointment process, and alongside this we have asked officials to consider a terms of reference for a review of the Office of the Commissioner. Senator Bradley, supplementary. Thank you, and thank you to the First Minister for that update. Can I also ask the First Minister if she could give an update on the Victims Forum and what appointments um, have been made to that, if any, and the conclusion um, stage of that, but any anticipated date she has? Well, the uh, Victims uh, Commission uh, continues in legal existence uh, even without the Commissioner, so that will continue in the interim, and they will work with uh, the Forum. They will interact with the Forum. Uh, there has not been any uh, fresh appointments made to the Forum, as I understand it, during the time when we uh, did not have devolution here. Uh, that being the case, uh, it may be time also to look at the Forum to see if it is representative of the different strands of victims right across Northern Ireland, and it's something uh, that we will be looking at alongside the review of the Commissioner's office. Call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the First Minister for her answers today. We all appreciate the, the urgent need for the appointment of a Victims and Survivors Commissioner. Can the First Minister give us an assurance that the needs of victims will continue to be met uh, until a Commissioner has been appointed? Yes, thank the member for his question. Indeed, the um, body corporate of the Commission for Victims and Survivors continues, and the Chief Executive Officer uh, will now be responsible for the day-to-day -day business of, of the Commission. Uh, and I think it's important to say that they still exist uh, as a reference point for victims if there are issues, and they should bring them forward uh, to the Commission. And also, of course, the Victims and Survivors Service um, will also continue to deliver services to victims and survivors throughout Northern Ireland during this time. Um, unfortunately, it will probably take up to about six months to have the new Commissioner in place, just because of the public appointments process, uh, Mr Speaker. But in the interim, uh, we will certainly want to work with the Commission and the, survivor, the Victims and Survivors Service to make sure that the voice of victims is heard. I call Gemma Dolan. And I think the Minister might have just answered this, but can I just clarify, um, can you outline a timescale for any new appointment of a Commissioner? Yes, so uh, as I was indicating, um, this appointment, like so many appointments, um, is regulated by the Commissioner for Public Appointments, uh, and as such, the process must comply with the Code of Practice for Ministerial Public Appointments, and uh, it's carried out this way to make sure that there is transparency and uh, support for the process, and it may take up to six months to complete, and that makes sure uh, that everyone can have confidence in the appointment process, and it will be open and it will be transparent. Moving on, I call David Hildage. The Junior Minister Lyons will answer this question. Mr Speaker, the Castle Mara and Northlands wards in Carrick Fergus and the Antiville and Kilwater wards in Larne form one of the eight areas of focus for the Communities in Transition project. Four projects are currently in delivery in this area under a number of key, thing, key themes capacity building, community safety, health and well being, and arts and culture. Furthermore, a regional project on restorative practice is being delivered uh, in all eight areas. Whilst COVID-19 had the potential to disrupt delivery, good progress has been made across all projects uh, thanks to the commitment, creativity and enthusiasm shown by delivery partners and officials. David Hilde, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Junior Minister for his answers there. Uh, with the COVID, I know these groups have gone well beyond the, their role, and I thank and congratulate them for that work during the COVID period. Which continues on. Can the junior minister provide further detail on the work that is being done and the number of people that are being impacted upon in those four projects that are being delivered in the Carrick, Fergus, and Larne areas, please? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Speaker. So I outlined the four areas. First of all, community capacity uh, building, and Intercom Ireland is the delivery partner for this project. Twelve groups have been recruited, action plans completed, and training needs identified. And a range of social action proposals are currently under consideration. Profile has been raised um, for the project, given the um, additional requests from individuals. 
uh, requesting to be involved from the community. Uh, in terms of arts and culture, Intercom Ireland is also delivering this project, and 33 participants have been recruited, and a handbook has been developed to inform training and development modules on arts and culture skills. Uh, planning is also underway for events in both areas uh, at Christmas. In terms of health and well-being, uh, this project is being delivered by Extern NI. Development interventions and specialised support with a number of referrals for mental health uh, support have already uh, been received. And then in terms of community safety, the, the delivery partner uh, for this project is Intercom Ireland and volunteers have been recruited and a community engagement forum uh, established. The community safety forum is in the process of becoming uh, a constituted group with a community safety uh, survey currently out uh, to residents. And also confirm uh, to the member that all of these um, projects are taking place uh, in each of the, the four areas that I have uh, listed uh, already. And additionally, uh, a tender competition to deliver a pilot programme on raising aspirations for compulsory school aged children and young people in the area was published on the 30th of October. And as the member will be aware, uh, raising aspirations is really uh, important as we seek to, to move forward and get our young people to move forward. Well, Roy Beggs. Mr. Speaker, I would like to indicate my support for such a programme which empowers the local community to represent their interests and enables them to deal with issues. But does the Minister accept that a separated prison regime helps to perpetuate societal issues around paramilitaries and only serves to give them a warped credibility when in prison and when they leave prison where they continue to try to exert influence? Well, I thank the, the member for his question, Mr. Speaker. And the, the entire um, point of the Communities in Transition programme is to try and to break uh, that coercive uh, control uh, and, and move our communities uh, forward. Uh, that's very much what this programme is focused on. We can actually see the results um, that have been delivered already and continue uh, to be uh, delivered. I'm glad that there, was a, uh, there has been political engagement uh, over the last number of, of weeks. We, we had a very uh, useful meeting on the, on the 10th of, uh, of November uh, with political representatives in the area to see uh, and to hear about the, the things that have been taking place uh, to end that course of control uh, and to limit the influence and reach of, 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 of paramilitary activity. Uh, of course, one programme by itself is not going to tackle uh, this problem, which can be very much deep-rooted uh, in our society. That's why it's incumbent upon all of us uh, to work together in all of the ways in which we can and to speak with one voice uh, against paramilitary activity and the course of control that they can have within our communities. Well, Philip McGuigan. John Collier, uh, can I ask the Minister to give an overview on Phase 2 preparations uh, on the delivery of Community and Transitions project? Uh, Mr Speaker, the Tackling Paramilitary Activity, Criminality and Organised Crime programme is currently due to expire in March 2021. Uh, the Executive has discussed and agreed in principle to a further phase of the programme to be delivered over a three-year period up until March 2024. The Communities in Transition project will be a significant part of the community-facing element in this next phase and subject to confirmation of budget and an ongoing government-wide budgeting exercise. It is hoped that the Communities in Transition project will have an indicative budget of £12 million. The interventions supported through the CIT project have been shaped and informed by communities in response to the very specific issues that manifest themselves in each locality. And the range of interventions continues to deliver much-needed community responses at a time when positive community leadership has never uh, been needed uh, before. Now, we recognise the commitment and innovation that has been shown across the CIT areas at this time uh, and assure our community delivery partners of continued support for their good work. These projects must be given time uh, to be embedded at a community level, but we are already seeing the impact of these interventions, and we must ensure that the necessary time is given to bring about the sustainable change and positive legacy that our communities want to see. Moving on, I call John O'Dowd. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will answer question 5 and 12 together. Over recent weeks, the UK and the EU have intensified their negotiations with the aim of securing an agreement. Discussions on the future relationship have continued since then. For an agreement to be in place for the end of the transition period, we understand that it must be negotiated by mid-November in order for the EU to complete internal processes. 
We welcome the commitment of both sides to continue discussions. However, we recognise that these talks could still result in a non-negotiated outcome. We are therefore continuing our operational readiness planning to include this possibility. A key challenge for departments in this planning process is the urgent clarity which is needed to implement both the protocol and any agreed deal with the European Union. Our officials have undertaken bilateral meetings with officials from other departments in order to scrutinise uh, readiness issues and identify possible mitigations, including where interventions would be required from the UK Government and assurances around continuity agreements or bilateral agreements. An executive action plan to address high priority readiness issues is in the final stages of development. John Day, supplementary. The Minister will be aware that in, before COVID had its devastating economic impact, uh, that we were in recession. And one of the reasons we were in recession was because of the uncertainty around Brexit and, our, and the uncertainty faced by our businesses and our employees. Uh, would the Minister agree with me that the worst case outcome? is that we have no deal at the end of these talks, and that will have a, devastating, a further devastating impact upon our economy. I thank the member for his question. Actually, uh, before COVID hit, the Northern Ireland economy was performing uh, well, uh, and we were pleased to see that happening. Uh, but, of course, uh, we do need to see an overall uh, agreement reached. Uh, we very much encourage uh, the negotiators to find that uh, way forward. Uh, we know that there are still some very significant uh, sticking points, particularly around fisheries governance and the level playing field issue. Uh, we hope that solutions can be found uh, to those issues in the coming days, because uh, if not, uh, then we will have a hugely significant task ahead of us um, running up to the end of the year. And, uh, the executive has agreed that there needs to be flexibility shown um, by others so that we do not reap the harvest of the protocol, which could cause severe difficulties to us, particularly with food stuff uh, coming from uh, Great Britain into Northern Ireland. So we do ask for flexibility, but we also hope that the negotiations reach uh, a good outcome. Paul Matthew Toole. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, there is an almost overwhelming amount of detail for this Assembly and for our economy to process before the end of this year. Um, it is frankly bewildering and scary. Uh, so, Can I ask the First Minister for an urgent update on the volume of primary and secondary legislation that this Assembly will be uh, uh, required to pass before the end of this year to give us a semblance of preparation? Because at the minute we have not had really any update from the Executive Office about what this Assembly will have to achieve in the next few weeks, and frankly it is not good enough. Well, I, I do not agree with the member that he has not had any idea as to what is expected of the Assembly and Executive. Um, we have been very clear that there will be a number of statutory instruments that will have to be brought forward and that the different committees are working their way through those statutory instruments. Uh, nobody is pretending for a second that if there is not a negotiated outcome that this is going to be a very difficult period ahead. Of course it is. Uh, but it is uh, very important that we all work together to make sure that we get through this uh, period of time of great uncertainty so that we can go into next year in a much more positive frame of mind. Very briefly, Steve Egan. Thank you very much indeed. May I thank the First Minister for our answers so far? Uh, Minister, yourself and the Deputy First Minister wrote on the 5th of November to the European Commission and received for the Europeans a prompt reply, but not a very forthcoming reply. Could the First Minister update us on any further steps the Executive Office is taking to ensure that we do have security of our food supply? I thank the member for his question, which uh, I think he, he raised with me in my statement about the British Irish Council last week as well. We felt there was a need to write to the Vice President of the Commission, uh, uh, Mr Sechkovic, if I get his uh, name right, uh, in connection with uh, the issue around goods coming uh, from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, particularly concerned about the fact that the Joint Committee has not reached agreement on goods at risk. Uh, we are now faced with uh, another challenge around pre-prepared meat products, uh, which the European Union is saying there is a, a difficulty around. Uh, the member might recall uh, the famous issue around lasagnas um, from uh, Great Britain into Northern Ireland. Uh, frankly, it is a nonsense because, as far as I am concerned, the lasagna comes over uh, in a supermarket truck which goes to a destination in Northern Ireland and is sold in sterling to a consumer. So 
So what is the difficulty? Um, so I hope that there is uh, enough flexibility shown by the European Union to find a solution to this problem. I also hope that they are not using this as a way to get their own way in the main negotiations. And that ends the period for a list of questions. And we move on to topical questions. And I call Meg Nesbitt. Speaker, thank you. Could I ask the First Minister, does she support the Women's Policy Group's document COVID-19, a feminist recovery plan? Uh, I'm very disappointed to tell the member that I haven't read uh, the document, but if he would like to share it with me, he's clearly read it in great detail. Uh, I'd be only too happy to come back to him about this. Meg Nesbitt, supplementary. Uh, I, I recommend the document to, to the First Minister, but also I recommend the response from uh, the Civil Service. And would she address the criticisms of the Women's Policy Group to that response, particularly the denial of the fact that there is a gender pay gap and the lack of reference to women, given that 82 per cent of part-time workers are female and therefore most affected by COVID-19? Well, thank you for raising that issue. And that is an issue of great concern to me and I, I, I believe to other members of the executive as well, because we know that women are disproportionately hit by the uh, COVID-19 restrictions. The fact that many of them are in part-time, low-paid jobs. Uh, the lady I was referring to uh, in, in my first answer, uh, who was seeking to take her own life because she felt there was no purpose left to her life, I think is something that we should be very, very concerned about. So absolutely happy to follow up with a member on that issue. Robin Newton. Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the First Minister for her answers so far? First Minister, can I ask you what is your assessment of the likelihood of a deal emerging between the government and the EU? Well, can I say to the member, and I hope he took from my comments uh, to Mr. O'Dowd, that I very much want to see a deal happening uh, between the United Kingdom and the European Union, uh, not just because it would be better for us here in Northern Ireland, but I think better for all of the countries involved and all of the institutions involved if we reach an agreement. Robin Newton, supplementary. I thank the Minister for her reply. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I wasn't in the chamber when Mr O'Dowd asked his question, so I apologise for that. <clears throat> but could I specifically ask you, Minister, uh, First Minister, what particular part of the text from an emerging uh, agreement would you be studying in particular reference to the Northern Ireland's position? So, thank the member for that. Of course, if there is a, a free trade agreement, that will make the operation of the protocol, which of course, as he knows, we are opposed to, uh, easier on the people of Northern Ireland. And we would have to deal with some of these issues that we've been talking about in terms of goods at risk uh, coming in from Great Britain into Northern Ireland, which of course is a complete anathema, given that we are part of the same country. Uh, but, however, uh, hopefully, if there is an overall agreement, then we won't have to deal with those thorny issues. Oh, Paula Bradley. Uh, first Minister, we, also, we all know that during um, the, the first part, when we first went into lockdown, local government played a, a, a great role in that. Can I just ask you, um, what role do you believe that they can play further in the battle against COVID? Thank the member for her question and uh, I'm pleased to say to the member that there has been very proactive and meaningful engagement uh, with local government, uh, principally through Solis and uh, the two junior ministers. I'm very pleased to see the way in which there's been engagement and the fact that they want to play a role uh, in dealing with COVID-19 and helping us to get COVID secure businesses and helping with community champions and ambassadors. Uh, and assurance schemes uh, to de-risk some of the issues that are out there. So, very pleased to say that local government is working very proactively. Paula Bradley, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the First Minister for her answer so far? Um, First Minister, surely to help with that battle of, for, uh, against COVID, we need tougher enforcement um, to deter those breaking your, the rules. Can you give us some views on that? Yes, tougher enforcement probably and more resource uh, and I think it's common cause across the executive that if we need uh, to put further resource into dealing with this issue then we will try and do that Mr Speaker but in terms of enforcement of course that is an issue for a number of agencies. Uh, again the junior ministers have been leading on this issue of enforcement and compliance. It is important that we see 
people called out who are simply going about rule breaking uh, and not listening to the messages around uh, why it's important to be COVID secure. So we will want to uh, continuously look at that issue, Mr. Speaker. It's a very important one. I call Paul Given. Uh, Speaker, I pay tribute to our frontline health workers uh, that are doing an incredible job under very difficult circumstances. First Minister, you may have not had an opportunity to hear uh, the talkback programme this afternoon, but uh, Professor Gabriel Scali, uh, a eminent public physician of world renown, was very critical of the Department of Health's surge plans and also overall public health leadership. Has the First Minister a response to the criticism that was relayed by the Professor? Well, I haven't heard uh, Professor Scali's uh, comments today. I'm sure he's not surprised by that. But it is important that we have plans in place to deal with the issues in front of us. And can I join him in paying tribute to our health and social care staff, all those people who have put themselves in harm's way for the community? And whilst there was a huge outpouring of support during the first wave, and I think a lot of our staff got through on adrenaline and recognising that there was huge support there. Uh, in this wave, I understand a lot of them are tired, a lot of them have uh, worked long, hard hours, and uh, I want to say to them their work has not gone unnoticed, and we deeply appreciate it from this House and from the Executive. Paul Gibbon, supplementary. Thank you, uh, First Minister, for that response. Uh, in respect of the support that is needed in the Department of Health, are there additional measures that the Executive Office can provide to the Minister uh, so that effective decision making in terms of the running of the internal Department of Health can be taken so that those frontline staff get the support that they need to provide the people of Northern Ireland with the best possible support? Well, certainly we continuously uh, speak with the Health Department uh, from the Executive Office and indeed across the Executive. And if there are specific issues that have arisen in relation to surge planning, uh, in testing, uh, in the rollout of the vaccination, we will be very much wanting to assist the Health Minister to deal with those issues because we recognise that this is an issue for all of us. Um, and I think it's important to say that because we want to tackle this together. And whatever about what happened last week, um, we all recognise that there is a need to step up and to deal with all of the issues in front of us because we are in a very difficult situation at present. I call Jim Allister. Thank you. Uh, Mr Speaker, new decade, new approach made this boast. This agreement marks a new approach to government in Northern Ireland. How is that going, First Minister? Well, given that uh, we only came back on the 11th of January, much to the delight of the member, um, that we then faced into a global pandemic, I think given that we're in a five-party coalition, we are dealing with the issues in front of us, and as uh, leaders in our community of all five parties, we want to see resolutions happen. Sometimes it doesn't look too pretty. We uh, accept that that is the case. But it doesn't take away the fact that we want to find solutions and we want to find a way forward because we recognise that the people of Northern Ireland have put their trust in us. First Minister, wasn't last week's omni shambles confirmation that even on what should be a unifying issue of public health, mandatory coalition, if it can't work on that, will never work, and that it's a cruel deception to the people of Northern Ireland who deserve better? to pretend that it will? No, I don't accept that. Um, he'll not be surprised at that. Uh, as I've said, it was a very difficult week. It was a torturous week. But I think it is right that we try and take decisions which are balanced and proportionate, which take into account the enormous pressure that our healthcare staff are under, uh, that our hospitals are under, but also recognises that people need to be able to earn a living, otherwise they fall into poverty and thereby fall into health outcomes that are very bad as well. So look, I make no apology for trying to get to a balanced and, and proportionate place, and I think that's where the people of Northern Ireland want us to get to too. I call Tom Buchanan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister, over the weekend, and, I get, and indeed again today, we have heard much criticism from parties around this chamber about the so-called abuse of the cross-community vote. As First Minister, can I ask you to respond to these criticisms? 
Well, given our history here uh, in Northern Ireland, there's a number of protections built in to the operating of the Assembly and the Executive, um, and there's also an obligation in the Ministerial Code to try and seek consensus rather than simply drive through controversial matters by a simple majority. And that protection is written into the Northern Ireland Act to ensure that sufficient consensus is achieved. And that safeguard can be triggered by any three members of any parties when they're opposed to a course of action uh, on any topic. So the determining factor subsequently then becomes the fairly blunt tools, and I accept that, of either parallel consent or weighted majority. Uh, but it is lawful uh, that that is used. And any impression created that the sufficient consensus requirement only applies to so-called uh, unionist or nationalist issues is entirely bogus and, frankly, is at odds with the Northern Ireland Act. And I think people might like to revisit the Northern Ireland Act and have a look at it. Tom Buchanan, supplementary. Thank the Minister for her response. Can I ask her, was a change in this voting mechanism an issue in the three years of negotiations to restore the executive? Uh, not that I'm aware of. The only suggestion I recall was from one of the smaller parties uh, to actually reduce the threshold for such protections from three ministers to two ministers. Uh, but you know, we all know that there are those who want to apportion blame and the use of vetoes and all the rest of it. But the truth is, of course, uh, Mr. Speaker, we should never have got to that point. Uh, and I hope that in our discussions. Uh, in the coming days, which again will be difficult, which again will be controversial, uh, that we can get to a position without the need of invoking any of that. Call Palm Cameron. Mr. Speaker, and I'm very conscious of the, the lack of clapping on a Thursday evening, of gifts being left at our hospitals, uh, the lack of marquees serving hot food and drink for our healthcare workers, particularly those on COVID wards and on ICU wards in the second wave of the pandemic. Can I ask the First Minister what her assessment is of the efforts of our health and care staff? Well, I want to thank the member for her question. She has absolutely put her finger on uh, the matter. I know the member has uh, family uh, in uh, positions in ICU, and I know therefore she will be fully aware uh, of the difficulties that our nursing uh, staff are currently facing. So I do want to say again um, that we absolutely support all of those who put themselves in harm's way. We know how restrictive all of this is, not just to when they're working, but actually to their home life as well. Uh, and we very much appreciate everything that they are doing. Alan Cameron, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her, her answer. And it's important that we show and demonstrate our support for the incredible work that our health care workers are doing in these most challenging of times. Could I ask the First Minister um, uh, if she believes the executive can find a balanced and a proportionate way forward over the winter months in dealing with COVID-19? Well, I think we have found a balanced and proportionate way forward. We need to continue to find that balanced and proportionate way forward. I do think that when we have the testing regime um, to a higher level of capacity, whereby we can um, test our staff in healthcare settings and social care settings and care homes on a more frequent basis, that will help. And it will also give them a sense of worth that we are uh, concerned about their well-being and make sure that we want to know what is happening in those settings. So I think the testing regime is very much part of what we need to do. And as I said to an earlier answer, or to an earlier question, uh, it is important that we take the learnings from the Liverpool experience uh, and use it here in Northern Ireland so that we can be more focused on, on using testing as a mechanism of cutting the transmission of the virus. Call William Irwin. Mr Speaker, and can I ask the First Minister, in light of the concern amongst business, the business community over recent COVID-19 closures and the impact of this, what assurances can, the, can be given that the uh, plan for reopening will be made crystal clear to these businesses and um, that, that they will get sufficient time to uh, know what's happening. So, Mr. Speaker, we really regret uh, the fact that our businesses were left uh, in the position they were left in last week. Uh, a lot of them have been really challenged in terms of stocking up, uh, in terms of the amount of money they have spent in dealing with COVID 19 uh, restrictions. 
Um, we want to try and be as clear as we possibly can with them moving forward. And so we will continue uh, to engage with the retail sector, with the hospitality sector, uh, and indeed with our faith sectors, as we do, uh, to try and get as many messages out and also to hear from them uh, as to what they can do to help us in this terrible time. Time is almost up. William Irwin, supplementary. Can I thank the First Minister for her response? And just to impress upon her the urgency of, of, and the situation that many of these businesses find themselves in, uh, uh, they're at Whitsand End Corner, and I know she's aware of that. And uh, it's important that they get clarity. Thank the member for that. Members, time is up, and could members just take a raise for a moment or two, please?